Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first thing in Mathematics of Motion seminar. So the seminar will occur around, depends, we don't have a specific frequency for the seminar based off the speakers. And today we are going to have our first speaker, Feng, who will speak about equidistribution and counting in negative curvature. So Feng, take it away. Great. Thanks. Thanks to all of you for being here. Great to be here, not on Zoom. Well, also on Zoom. <laughs> um, what? Oh, yeah, we need to pin the uh, yeah, screen. Yeah, pin the speaker. No, I think we're good. No, 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 no. Pin no, no, no. um, yourself. Pin yourself. Pin. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. And it's recording, right? Yeah, it should be recording, yes. Okay, so today I want to tell you about some counting problems that you can solve with the help of dynamics. And I'm gonna, so I know this start this book for 90 minutes. I'm hoping to talk for about 60 minutes. And then the rest of the time, you should ask me whatever questions you want. And in particular, so different people may be more or less familiar with different things. So if there's something that I don't define that you want me to define or talk about, feel free to ask me. So, okay, counting problems. What is a counting problem? Well, what is the kind of counting problem I'm gonna talk about? So here's the first example. This first example is not gonna use any dynamics, but it is the kind of counting problem I'm gonna talk about. So let's say you have a lattice in Euclidean space. Right, so I write our N. You should think of it as there's a Euclidean metric there, so I can measure distances. So it can be any lattice, but for the purposes of illustration, you might as well think of just a standard square lattice. Um, I can keep going on forever. Um, okay, so then you can ask, sorry, I'm gonna use the murder victim marker. <laughs> Can ask how many orbits, how many lattice points are there? there? Infinitely many of them. If I draw a ball radius r around the base point, then how many of them are there in this ball radius r? Right? Can I describe this as some function of r asymptotically? Because I take bigger and bigger r. Right. So. Um, And when I write this, I mean quite specifically that the ratio of this thing, I'm gonna call this number n sub r. Uh, so this means the ratio of this to whatever function I might have on the right hand side as a function of r, the ratio of the two sides should go to one. As I take r to infinity. Um, and one other comment I want to make is that I say lattice points, you can also think of them, or really more precisely, you should think of it as orbit points. Of the action of this discrete group on this space, where like how's the group acting? Well, you If I have a point in the space and an element of the group, well, I think of the element, I think of this point as like the origin in the vector space. Kind of abusing the fact that this is Euclidean space, but it also has a vector space structure in this case. And then this point, uh, this group element, you also think of as a vector. And you just move it by the back there. Okay. Sorry, I just said a bunch of words, but any questions so far? Okay, so that is point, same as orbit points. How many orbit points are there in this ball around origin? So in this case, you can kind of solve the question geometrically. I'm writing bigger than I thought I would, but that's great for people on Zoom. 
Um, any guesses what you might write here? Yeah. Sorry. No. Wait, volume of what? Uh, in terms of what asymptotics? Yeah. Oh, it's uh, very roughly shifting the volume of the box. Yeah. Fun? Yeah, every of the ball we come up with. Yes. Hi. 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 Uh, can you um, maybe uh, give a little bit of summation of the last five minutes? The last five minutes. Okay, so that's the title. Um, and at some point I said we're going to use dynamics to solve coming problems, but that hasn't happened yet. So now I'm just talking about a coming problem of the kind that we are going to talk about more generally. So the counting problem is you have a lattice in Rn with think of just a square grid. Yeah. And then you pick a base point, say the origin, you draw the ball of radius r on the base point, and you ask how many lattice points are there in that ball of radius r. Okay. Maybe some number, and then as you take r bigger and bigger, maybe there's some yeah. function in r that describes this asymptotically. Yes, OK. So yeah, and then I'm going to add a co-volume here. But this is just the volume or area of one of these little squares, which in this case it is the usual square grid that that one. OK, I'll improve this. Also, someone stop me if you don't want to see this group. So, well, I, I already said the words little square, or it's a fundamental domain for this action. Right. Move the yeah. camera. It's kind of hard to move the board. That is point, I should say. This orbit in one of one correspondence with translates from. This joint translates of the fundamental domain, or like all these different little squares down here. Right. Well, each of these squares you can associate, say, the lower left corner. No reason I take the lower left, you just have to choose one of the four consistent. Um, and then if you want to see what this is, well, you might as well count how many squares are there in your ball radius R. And now there's a dramatic. Yes. So uh, you said that the lattice points in the ball are quite quite of the size of the orbit orbit points on T N right? Yes. Um isn't isn't the orbit just all of the end, right? That's what is here here. So yes. <laughs> uh, I mean okay, I guess so these points are in correspondence with orbit points in the ball. Right. So now we are trying to count these, and now there's this geometric observation that um, if you have one of these squares, all these translates from the fundamental domain, it intersects the ball. Right. Now it may not be completely contained in it, but it intersects the ball if and only if it is completely contained in a slightly bigger ball. Um, and there's some constant. I think it is true. I think it could be square of two, I think. Something about the diameter of this square. Uh, okay. But because of this, how many squares could there be here? Well, it's at least the number of squares you can fit into a slightly smaller ball. This is the volume, the slightly smaller ball. I'm going to keep writing these volume terms, although in this case they're all one. Um, and it's number of squares in here is at most the number of squares you could fit into the slightly bigger ball. So 
Okay. So now, now you can divide all three sides by diagonal. Solve the same kind of counting problem with a slightly different group action. So now we're going to have a closed hyperbolic surface meaning contact with no boundaries. Okay, when I say the word hyperbolic surface, is everyone okay with that? Um, so that's a close hyperbolic surface. I'm going to take the fundamental group of this thing to the quadric group, gamma, and yeah. Now this thing is going to act on the hyperbolic thing. Because it's not just a topological surface, it's a hyperbolic surface. Um, and now you can ask the same question, which is okay, here's the model of the hyperbolic plane. That's it, so A. This could be a copy of the fundamental domain. Uh, and now you can ask if I take a Base point in the hyperbolic plane. Just think of all radius r in there. Right? How many orbit points do I see in this ball? And the function of r. Any guesses for this one? What function you might be able to put here? Perhaps the hyperbolic volume, but this is probably not very good choice. Well, uh, should blow up, uh, perhaps too fast. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to guess that we guess right. Um, uh, yeah, so this is the volume of the surface, which is going to be the quotient of the hyperbolic thing by this group. Yeah, this action. Right. Uh, so that's actually still true. I'm going to. Upgrade it a little bit this time. Um, and so uh, you you were saying maybe it doesn't work because something's gonna blow up. Yeah. That's a good point. Um but somehow the result is still true. So that does it make this proof not work. <laughs> so let's see why the this proof doesn't work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, for a while, it still kind of works because you still have this correspondence between, I don't know, that's octagon. But anyway, I want to say you still have this correspondence between these orbit points and translate to the fundamental domain. And then this statement is still true, maybe with a different value of epsilon, but your fundamental domain is still compact. So you can still choose another thing. Is that true? Uh, that's okay. Something changes here, which is that the volume of a ball in hyperbolic space is exponential in the radius. Uh, if it's actually hyperbolic space, then it's actually just exponential. Yeah, I <laughs> uh, right. Anyway, this like the last time. Hyperbolic time. Hyperbolic time. 
And it's the same order, right? Bro. <laughs> it's the same yeah. order, bro. It doesn't really make a difference. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it grows exponentially. I mean, in the sense, if you take the volume of the exponential board, made this R and you divide it by e to the R and then the like I goes into the ratio of both parts. Okay. Anyway, so you have to replace these quadratic functions in radius, which may be volume of a volume in the space. Functions that are going exponentially. Right. So that's the true statement. Uh, uh, I have to put some on the bigger than constants. Uh, then, as you take out infinity, well, the left hand side goes to that. Maybe there's a constant. And then Right hand side goes to something slightly bigger. Or sometimes it doesn't know how bigger. So, okay, you've proven something, which is that this thing, this number of orbit points in the ball is by the trip to this ratio. Actually, you can prove something stronger with a different proof. Uh, okay, question so far. Okay, so why didn't this quite work? Well, the area of the ball was just too much of the area near the boundary. Sometimes, right? So, you, asymptotically, you can't get the squeezing at the one because of this. But you can show that there's some kind of there's enough cancellation that happens in terms of what orbit point, which orbit points. How many orbit points are in the boundary or not in the boundary? So on average, asymptotically, that still works out. And to make what I, I just take my hands a bunch, how do you make that precise? How do you use, formulate that in terms of dynamics? So Mark, uh, I'm just trying to remember you. Mark Willis. I think he proved quite this state because it's stronger than one that where he actually got an error term. Or am I, or am I misremember? Um, I actually don't know. <laughs> it's possible that you're right. I think this is the, the this is part of the whole thing is that uh, the 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 big problem is getting the the, uh, error, term. the error term. But. It's been, it's been a while since I thought about this, so I could be a zero. Yeah, I'm not sure. I can try to say a little bit more about it. Um, okay, so. Yeah, I guess I'm going about this in steps. So there's, she has a slightly more precise statement and then there's an actual even more precise statement. What we're going to show is that if you take the R plus epsilon ball and you take out the R ball, so this like epsilon annulus from the R ball, we're going to show it equidistributes in the surface. Or technically, I should say, in the unit tangent bundle to the surface. That's our guess, I guess, bigger. Um, not sure what I mean by that. Oh, there will be a multiplication. Um, and because of this, well, I guess now I'm just writing down something I said a moment ago. I think. And we actually make more precise versions of these sentences. I'm going to want a flow on the surface or on the unit end of funnel. And I want to define a measure to say what on average. Uh, okay. So 
So the so is going to be the geodesic so. Everyone happy with the geodesic so? Okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> And then the measure. So does anyone have a favorite symbol for measure? You. you. I don't want to use that one yet. I'm sure I'll pull a different measure. Well, F. And, yep. So, do you think of the flow in terms of the passion space or the floor? It's uh, yeah, I mean, because if you have a surface, I just give you a point, this it doesn't specify like which direction it goes. I right, say, like, this point is tangent vector, or if you see a tangent vector, then you can, if you want to go for time t, you go along the tangent to be the for time t. It's a Flow on the unit that is this. You always want to keep track of which direction you're going. Sorry, what's this? Gamma. And also right signal, I guess. So on the surface, and the surface is a, oh, I guess it's also right. Does anyone have a strong opinion when I take portions on the left or right? Okay, I don't. That's my flow. The measure is going to be an isometry group invariant measure. On the unit tangent um, If the next word make any sense to you, yeah, it's you can think of it as coming from the Ha measure on TSR2R. If both words don't make sense to you. Uh, another way you can think of it is you can take the unit tangent bundle to the hyperbolic plane, right? And you can parameterize this as pairs of distinct points on the boundary. So pairs of distinct points. This boundary of hyperbolic thing. Because if you have a pair of distinct points on the boundary, that defines a by tenant to these for you. And then there's a real, there's a line split of unit tangent vectors along this line. That's like a parameterization. And then in terms of this parameterization, you think think of the measure as locally it's the big on the boundary plus the big on the boundary plus the big on the real factor. And this thing is also called the little bit measure. Yeah. Little bit measure. No. <laughs> okay, it's not. <laughs> I, I found it seems a little bit measure. I just want to say the part is not what we What do you think about it? Infinitesimally. The same yeah. yeah it's, it's not a global product. Yeah. Okay, anyway, that's my measure. That's a flow. I'm going to, going to define a set. This is just notation more than anything to denote the annulus. Uh, Really, I want some subset of the unit tangent bundle. So uh, we need to specify directions. So these are going to be all the outward vector vectors over this angle. Uh, say this, but also for some specific small value of R. Right. 
strips in this animals, and then you can call the output from it. And the point is that when you slow this thing by the 36 slow, you should get a bigger annual from an annual is around a bigger ball. And this value is you choose some small enough value so that this thing is still embedded in the portions of this. Because right, you can imagine you take an annulus in the hyperbolic plane, if it's a really big radius annulus, when you project down to the quotient, maybe it's all like folded up and runs into itself. But if the radius is small enough, you don't have that problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what the the yeah. So we live in the space. Um. Yeah. So this is really a subset of the unit and the funnel. A is not a subset of the What does it need to be? Yeah, I mean, at each point on this analysis, you choose the output point. Right? Yeah. You do that right now. Yeah, it's called the field. You draw what you need to do. I mean, right now it is this guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then. <laughs> Now you can write down what it means to what you're going to write down a statement that translates this in a even more mathematical language. So it says that also that sentence is kind of in terms of set when I'm saying this set actually distributes the statement I'm going to write in terms of functions, and that just gives you a bit of extra flexibility. So I'm going to say for any function, any continuous function on the unit tended bundle to the surface, I want so that if I integrate the function over some big angular, that's my maybe not very big angular, but if I slow for a long time. Sorry, I'm still not sure what this point. I mean, is this trivial? I don't know. I mean, when it, what, I mean, what I have in mind is maybe this annulus somehow uh, twists somewhere and then reconnects. Um, you won't have a few choice of an upward point. Whatever. I mean, this is some of all this stuff. Yeah, this is all that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, I will cheat a little bit. Then you start to do this and then you know it's not going to work. You can have this Yeah, then you. And then you look at the projection and then it's a little bit beautiful. You put all that, you can already want to do it. But yeah, it's a good point. It's, you avoid some problems like static because you know that's what the hyperbolic thing. Uh, okay, so now I should write this. Um, anyway, if I do this over big and big annuli in the limit, the integral converges to what I get if I just integrate over the whole 
independent level. And then there's some normalization factors. That's a function. If you want a statement in terms of sets, you use characteristic functions. But it's approximations to characteristic functions. And what well, this is you know, a nice way of saying that. Um, okay. There is a quantified. Sorry, what is this one? Small scatter. Yeah, but A is Wait, hold on, which more are you? Yeah, right. Um, no. I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah. So this thing is some animals, if you pull that animals, you just check the game again. Yeah. Right. I mean, if, as long as you show this so that the angular doesn't crash into itself when you start. I think the limit should be like this. It's the same, the same statement you see. F of A R. F of A R. There are two. Um, I mean, it, it yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, and of epsilon. Yeah. Say, where we have epsilon doesn't matter and small. Um, I am saying small r doesn't matter, but let's say, well. Discussed before, I tried it. It's all the And would this be true for every epsilon prime smaller than epsilon, let's say? Or not necessarily? Yeah, then we can, can take more carefully. <laughs> uh, take thinner and thinner amuli, yeah. then would it still hold? Like if you could take it should, yeah. infinitely thin amuli, okay. Yeah. So it's a certain epsilon that for every epsilon smaller than it is should hold. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So some comments on the proof. Wait, wait, wait. Um, um, right. So first step, which is really the main dynamical ingredient that you show that this flow is fixing with respect to this measure. Um, that's a good question. So I'm going to say that next, which means that so this is like morally, it's like saying this dynamical system is somewhat chaotic. Um, and more precisely, as if you have any two functions, two functions. So, I apologize for using C for two different things, but they have different fonts. Um, if you have any two functions, you might take one of them and hit them by the flow. And multiplied by the other one. And then I integrate this product. And asymptotically, as equal to infinity, that integral converges to the product of the integral of the two functions. Oh, is this something like equivalent to strong mixing? Yeah, it's, uh, I, don't, I believe it's strong mixing. <laughs> Yes. And there's a normalizer. And then there are some normalization factors which come up with this. Uh, 
Uh, one over. No. Oh, uh, one over, and then one over. Right. So partly in response, my comment is what you are added a little bit. You wrote it that way, so that you can see the next thing in that. Um, And then, right, so to actually prove this, it would be a film talk. And there's a bunch of nice geometry and you know, dynamics that go through this. I guess I'm not going to talk about it right now. And then there's a second step, which um, and the second step one is again from the distribution. Which depending on how much you wipe your hands, it's gonna take more or less work. But so Normally, you just take one of these functions to be a characteristic function. Because then what happens is um, this. So f is one of my functions. This is my other function. And then now that's just like taking the integral of your original function over the annulus. And mixing tells you that this doesn't directly go to the product of two integrals. And then there's a yeah, fact out here. But the second integral is just a volume. Move it here as a volume term. So then, practice <laughs> um, uh, okay, more careful, which maybe you are so going to say my next sentence, and then you should ask your question. Let's do that, which is um, right. You took some annulus, started throwing it. Seems like yeah, we have been doing this. <laughs> Values of R. Um, and there's this technical bit which says actually it's okay. So, um, not actually the right dilemma. Apologize. It's got a way from the um, which basically says that, well, if I take this annulus and I flow it for a large period of time, it's it still looks like an annulus. It's still something that's within the actual neighborhood of an actual circle or image of a circle of the connected. That's also a good question. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so if you well, the characteristic functions, then you can get the definitions of sets, which probably you're going to get wrong. <laughs> um, so we have two sets, measurable sets. Uh, 
then if you hit one of them with a low and you intersect the other, and you look at the measure of this intersection, then right, then if this is fixing, then this should be asymptotically just the measure of the two sets, and the product of the measure of the two sets. And this is probably not. So, this statement is true and the probability factor. It's just a finite measure. Right. Yeah. So, if you like random variables, you can also look at this statement in terms of functions. Think of the functions as random variables, and this is saying the correlation, like asymptotically, the two things become uncorrelated. Okay, any other questions? Okay, but this is supposed to be step one, like with distribution. Step two, which I apologize, I'm gonna kind of wave my hand even more because we thought is to get from this statement to the counting statement. So remember, we want to prove this. Which I guess I didn't say this before, but maybe I'll say it now. So the uh, no, that's why does that fun? Yeah, it's all. Yeah. <laughs> um okay. Uh yeah, right. This is what happens when you think it's not like a some kids that you Yeah, so actually let me get back to that now that I say the next bit. I think it will be slightly relevant. Uh, not this bit. This bit I'm just gonna write. This thing is asymptotically e to the R. This thing you can compute using gospel if you want. Um, anyway, how do you do? How do you get here? That statement. Um, so you cheat a little bit. Can you say, actually, the other structure I haven't used. So, I don't know, maybe you don't think of this as cheating. But, in a tangent bundle in a hyperbolic plane, you can identify with the SL2R. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? Okay. And then when you do, okay, and then when you the tangent bundle, the surface is this portion. And then now there's a better description of this. Okay, which when I come to think of it is slightly different than what I wrote. But this is sometimes it's the proper definition which is this is this kind of that group, just like what we see as a whole. And then we don't just want a circle, we want something with some areas of the type that's more like a wooden identity. Then you might want you might worry like okay now I saw this and I now I have to like like away from them and still looks enough like an animus that stays so the image of a circle. Um okay, but you do this and then you go, I have this number, it's really nice if it were a function. 
maybe because I have this all this machinery that makes it functions and tells me stuff. So we're gonna make a function out of it. Um, this function is gonna tell us a number of orbit points and orbit points in a translated ball we define. Um, what is this assumption? Oh, it's going to take in elements in here. But this thing, yeah, I bet they're defining it. So, you do this, and then you use the distribution and you write a few lines of integrals. It's not very terrible, but maybe I don't want to write a few lines of integrals like I've got to do. So. Say, I'm just going to say you write a few lines of integrals. Argument sometimes goes by the name of holding and holding. And then you get the resulting one. Um, apologize just a little bit for the lack of details. The general idea is that like here you have some homogeneous structure that you can use. You know, so very nicely. <laughs> uh, so, so let me point out that I just said the homogenous, they didn't really show up until, well, okay, they showed up here, but we brought them up, but we didn't use any homogenous structure. We didn't use that. And now I want to say that I'm going to make the same general idea work without this modern structure. And we'll do an example where that happens. Uh, so example three, which might look a little bit similar to side. Like I said, the outline is similar. There are some different ideas that come into play. So now we're going to have a hyperbolic surface with boundary. Or, well, we don't want to have a good easy just run into the boundary and then not know what to do. So we're going to catch a funnel here. And I'm going to take the fundamental group of this hyperbolic surface. Yeah, I'm going to call it Uh, same question. So, I'm going to ask how many orbit points. Are there in a ball of radius R around how many points? Yep. Just here, the attachment to the boundary runs gray, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, so if you look up there in the universal cover, then this tunnel looks to the halfway. And there are all these halfway. Okay. Any guesses for this? Okay, and here we go. The one with the volume of control in some state. 
Well, is this going to be something like it related to the House Drug Convention of the Women's Act or something like this? No, but I don't know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then. I actually don't know a short way to describe the answer other than some exponential. Exponential in R. Um, and in some sense, this is right. It's the measure of the ball. It's some measure that's fairly explicit. I guess I'm going to spend the next like maybe 10, 20 minutes describing that measure. Uh, okay, but first observation. That's Pretty good guess because okay, you can try. This is still the hyperbolic plane, right? So you can try to maybe use the same arguments we just did for the last example, and then you're gonna run into the problem that everything just goes away. You understand that if you take some geodesic, take some unit tangent vector, start going on the geodesic with probability one, like almost all of them. According to the Liverpool measure, I'm going to eventually just go out the funnel and I'll never come back. And one thing that means is that you can't possibly hope to get mixing with respect to this measure because everything just comes out. You know what happens up there? You probably know what happens up there. You have like no control. I get mixing. Um, so, okay, that's a problem. Do it well. You put on your best mathematician hat and say, "Problem is most things go away." I'm going to redefine most so that that doesn't happen. Um, right, and by redefining most, I mean you construct a new measure so that in this new measure, almost none of your duty, none of your flow lines goes up the like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I guess you'll see in the moment, maybe. I just tried the construction. You should ask again. <laughs> you have a question. Um, so, uh, uh, I guess I'm going to write this is still exponential. In our, and we prove this. We're going to follow the same outline as before, but we want to do this with a different measure. So, Let's measure on the unit and run them to the surface. Okay. It's kind of more convenient to do this way. I'm going to build a measure on the unit and run them to the hyperbolic plane. And I make sure it's in okay. So if I build a measure here, that's invariant under the action of the heat cover, then I can push that forward to the measure on the heat and then follow the surface. And remember that see at some point this thing you can describe as as a distinct point on the boundary. And so I'm gonna build this measure as infinitesimally some measure on the boundary or some measure on the boundary. Of the bake. And this measure on the boundary is where kind of all the magic happens. So, right, what was the problem we were trying to find our way out of? The problem was that if you look at two of these, let's say, here in the universal, 
in the hydraulic plane. Most of them, according to the old measure, are going to go straight out on a V system at all. Okay. So we kind of want to ignore all those. We want to give the rest of the geodesics to less again. And the rest of the geodesics are the ones which have both ends not in one of these lists of half, not in one of these half plates. Okay. So they have. You know, there were limit sets before they had both ends in the limit set. This group. Um, we haven't heard the word limit set before. Well, um, the finite group that's the limit set is the set of all accumulation points of the orbit, which are in the non region. And Right, so we want measures which are supported on this subset of the bound. And in fact, you can do this. So there's going to be a whole family of finite measures, uh, one for each point in the hyperbolic plane. Maybe I should. Okay, I should write my. You can find such a value that is. Uh, there are measures from the dark green. Uh, such a okay, this state, first statement is a little bit loose, but you can say that if I hit the measure of some subset of the boundary, then this should give me more or less the proportion of the orbit. Accumulating to that subset, which orbit orbit at this point? And there's is there actually a fairly explicit formula for this. It's some weighted sum of the rack masses at the orbit points, orbit points of X. Um, anyway, that's the idea. The big it should follow from this the more precise version of this that these measures are supported on the limit set. And then Sammy also has some other nice properties. So it's equivariant to respect to gamma, meaning if I take the measure for gamma x, that's the same as the measure for x. And then there's also a formula for the right and make it in derivatives, uh, which is exponential and there's some constant associated with the group gamma. And then there's something in terms of these functions, which how unhappy or happy is everyone with this function? Okay. Okay. So I'm not going to define it, but um, you're not that happy with it. What I'm going to say is this is some geometric object associated with the hyperbolic plane, or more specifically associated with this boundary point of the hyperbolic plane. So you can calculate these quantities in terms of some number of constant associated to the group and geometric data. Geometric data associated with that. Um, and you might look at this and be like, okay, why does this matter? Um, I guess I'm not quite going to go into enough detail to see this, but the point is that, or oh, the point is what I'm going to write next. So let me write <laughs> um, Which is, these are measures on the boundary, and now I'm going to define the measure on hyperbolic. The unit gender plane. Um, and it has a name by this formula. So we're using in this parameterization. So B sub points on the boundary. That's the real number. This is going to be one of these measures. 
the demo one of these edges of three same letters. Five so big. And then there's a constant that goes up here. I'm not going to write what it is. It is a very explicit formula for it. It looks kind of like this. Exactly that. But the same kinds of objects come in here. And you choose this. Quite a way. Choose these scalar factors so that this measure is gamma invariant. And part of the point of this is that you can write something like this in terms of the same geometric data and constants. So that So maybe look a bit technical, but the point is you can write down all these measures and you like with respect to this new measure, almost all of your trajectories of the geodesic so don't go up to that. And then you can hope to prove mixing with respect to this measure. And you do have mixing with respect to this measure. Yeah. So you can also one. You no, uh, that's a good question. The measure of class doesn't matter itself. Maybe that's uh, actually, no, maybe it doesn't. You get back to you, <laughs> possibly like half a check something. Um, Anyway, well, now let's just say fix on X. And then you can show that, well, this is the name it. We have a measure on the independent funnel of the surface. So, gamma. And okay, the proposition is that this is the measure is finite. Maybe you find believable. This kind of by construction, these things are supported on the limit set. This thing is going to be supported on the convex hull of the limit set. But the portion of the convex hull of the limit set is, well, the convex hull is what you get after you take out all these hard things. And then the quotient of that is this hyperbolic surface wave boundary. You just come back. And then I came in to show that measures went on. So that you think the measure will come back to this finite. That's true. Okay. So that's the new measure. Um, and then you can show that you get mixing with respect to this measure for the geodesic flow. And then as a consequence of that, yeah, I say consequence, but it's somewhat to show, but you can prove this type of distribution here. Um, which I know, Sienna, you may or may not say about the attribution, but I'm going to attribute this to my fingers for now. Um, here's echo distribution segment. Which now I'm going to write just in terms of measures. So here's a measure which is some scalar multiple. This scalar multiple of the sum of direct masses. Which also depends on x and y. Um, why this thing? Okay, let me write the statement and I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, that's a measure, and I want to claim that this measure echo distributes. Uh, so I'm particular, this measure converges weakly to 
this other value vector. And convergence so weekly means okay, so this is what we saw before. So if I have any continuous function on this space, which is a little bit troubling because it's not compact, we'll go ahead and compactify it. So if I have any function, this is like an integral. These integrals are over the space. Uh, and this converges to the effective of the limit. And I guess, as a, so now I've kind of packed all the work into this statement. But if you have this statement, then step two previously becomes really easy because now you take the constant one function, you integrate it against both sides, and then on this side, you're going to get the scalar multiple of the number of points, orbit points, in this hall. Right. The number of points, number of orbit points have been this signature. And on the other side, you get these passes. And then there's a constant which I'm not going to move over to this side. And after this, this, um, like this. Resemble previous notation. So number of orbit points in the T border on X is this exponential with somewhat like this constants. <laughs> Questions. Right. Yeah, so one thing I'll say is that um Right, there's no modular structure. Um, is it so much modular structure here? So we have this new matter. So kind of instead of saying you take the whole and boundary annulus and it's equidistributes, you're kind of working more locally in neighborhoods, and then you use use all this control that you have over the measure. Like what we found in these actually kind of meant a little bit to say that things work well. Um, okay, so now you can make a decision if you want to hear about the last thing I'm more by the way. Oh, sorry. It says that the number of orbit points in the ball radius here on X is, X is asymptotically exponential. And then the constants are the, these kind of constants are easier. And I'll also show comment in response to your comment earlier. So we, these numbers, delta, they are related to components. Remember how exactly they might be equal. Uh, yeah. uh, of the really just what happens when you integrate one against the measure. It's a finite measure. So one thing that is what are the of delta? Oh delta. Um well, <laughs> well it's bounded between so it's bounded about by one and below by half uh, okay. But it's bounded about by one and started away from zero. So last thing I wanted to 
say, or well, last example I wanted to talk about was if you set up this, well, I just go away, but now that you have this measure, this new measure, and the Fabio measures on the boundary that came with it, you can also try to use them to solve a slightly different counting problem. So here's a closed hyperbolic surface again. And then now we're going to look at the set of, yeah, that again going to be a fundamental group. And this action doesn't matter so much for the question I'm going to ask, but the question I'm going to ask is if I look at the set of all closed geodesics on the surface. Of length at most L. So how many of those are there? Any guesses? Or questions? Zero. <laughs> These are lessons on this problem there. Okay. Um, then not give you the answer to the end. Uh, but here's a measure which maybe will help us count these things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going way further away from the things that are on the practice. Okay. Um, okay. Some sense it's so when you do that, you can also think of that as you're modifying the action. Right? To modify the space, yeah, I think of the action as a bonus plane. And then when you do that, well, it's a better thing like that. Okay, so you might have a different measure. So maybe you can still use the same approach. When you get a different answer. Any other questions? Um, okay, so here's a measure. Uh, so you can think of it as a measure on the unit tangent bundle to the surface if you want. How well you take this for each of these close to these x, you take all the unit vectors and do it, and then you give them some mass. So you give them a uniform map so that when you integrate around the closure of these, if you get one. Uh, that's how I'm going to think of this sum of the reactive masses on the closure of these as a measure on the unit tangent bundle of the surface. It's a measure, um, you can take a mountain moment if you want. Uh, why? Because this is now enough. Immediately obvious, but with some analysis, you can show that this is as L goes to infinity. If you take this measure minus this other measure, that converges to zero. So that's all that means. And here, the no L of G is the length of G, which is at most L, but might be smaller. But in the limit, I think asymptotically it doesn't matter. Okay. Why that? So, uh, yeah, so these are all measures on the 
in it and another decision? Or just give all the intended factors and the approach of these exam maps so that we can integrate around the approach of these if you get one. So now this this thing um you can wear this to a little bit loosely, but this to this measure on the unit and the plane with the hyperbolic plane. I say this to, I mean, if you take this measure on the unit tangent model with the hyperbolic plane and you look at its push forward in the quotient, the push forward is that. Any questions at all? I just wrote a bunch more symbols. <laughs> so these are like the right classes at the hyper and repelling, and repelling fixed points on the boundary. Um, and this thing, well, a little bit more analysis. So these arguments, this thing is asymptotically the same as the and now you go. Yeah. So this measure is the one that measures our previous error. Two some multiple of this. Um, okay, and then this form, and this thing, when you push forward to the quotient, push this forward to that. So it's getting a little bit faster than these good constants for the normalization. If you did things more carefully, <laughs> you will work out. Um, but the upshot is this measure on the enter part of the surface converges to that one. And out of it, really. So then, if you integrate the constant one function against both sides of this, what you get on this side is L times the number, and what you get on the other side is E to the number. So if you move the L over, then this. And this is again the result of working with. Sorry, people on Zoom, the market. That's what I wanted to say. Please feel free to ask all the questions. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. And let's give Peter. Okay, so if there aren't any questions, then we can thank Peg again. We have to do an excellent talk. And you can